All right, everybody, this is Ross. Uh, very recently, a viewer of mine had contacted me and was wondering if I could come and do some consulting work for her. Um, she lives in the Philadelphia area, as I do, so she's nearby. And she said, hey, uh, Ross, you know, um, I'm trying to really construct and build a, uh, a nice little uh, section of my yard where I can grow a lot of fruit. Um, I've been gardening for a long time, uh, but I'm not really sure about the fruit trees and the fruiting plants. And uh, I don't know where to put things. I don't know where to place them. Um, she probably was also interested in, you know, maybe some ideas of kind of what are some things that she should grow. Um, she really was, I think, very interested in, in kind of picking my brain on this particular topic. And, um, you know, normally I would say to anyone who's interested in consulting work, put together a list of questions and get back to me. Because if I think the, the list of questions is long enough and extensive enough to warrant, um, you know, some consulting work, then I usually go ahead and, and go through with it. But for this particular person, I thought, well, she's really just concerned about placement and, you know, it's just some general rules of thumb. Well, I might as well just tell her the information she wants to hear uh, or needs to hear and kind of move on with my day. Um, and, you know, not waste her time or her money. So that's exactly what I did. And I figured, you know what, instead of just kind of keeping that information to between her and I, uh, why don't I make a video with that information? Um, or information kind of like that, that I think is just, uh, in general, you'd probably need to read a book, uh, consult somebody like myself. Uh, you know, why don't I just give you guys some basic pointers on what I've learned here in the Philadelphia area in terms of growing fruit. And I guess the most important thing and really I think the thing that should be on everybody's mind, it really doesn't matter where you guys live, is really about the sun. Because we live, uh, you know, plants were evolved, have evolved uh, <laughs> with the sun. So photosynthesis is really just an absolutely critical piece, especially for getting good fruit quality, right? It's, I don't know about you guys, but you know, it, it, maybe when you first start out, your aspirations are pretty limited to, I just want to get fruit. I just want to be able to harvest fruit in my backyard. See, for me, I'm, I'm beyond that at this point, and I don't want to just be able to harvest fruit in my backyard. I want to be able to harvest the best fruit I possibly can. And for me, that's over the years now I've been doing this, I've learned it's really all about the sun. The more sun that the trees and the bushes and the vines and these different fruiting plants, even the garden, receives, the better the harvest will be, not just in terms of quantity or size, but in terms of something called the bricks, which measures the soluble sugars in whatever it is that you're growing. And uh, that's a really good indicator of just overall nutrient levels um, and also the flavor of just how much better it's going to taste. So for me, um, when I consult people and I try to uh, educate people on you know, this particular topic, it's really about the sun. And it's critical to have the right amount of sunlight for every single thing that we grow. Now, not all of us are lucky enough to live in an area like you know, myself here. I don't really get full sun. Very few areas of my yard at this point get full sun because we just have so many shade trees these are very large old maples and black cherries and there's many of them and right now you could say that this area i'm in uh, is this southern exposure but but this is south and look at the you know the coverage here that will inevitably fill itself in as time goes on and the trees get larger and and larger and the sun only goes a certain height in the sky so for me i'm dealing with and as many of you guys are, an area of trying to grow fruit, a backyard of trying to grow fruit, that's just not ideal. If I had sunlight all day, I'd be in business. I'd be really ripening super high quality fruit. I'd have a lot less disease pressure. Um, you know, even the, the methods I use here and, and different things that I may even consider in terms of pruning or 
just in general, maintenance might actually be vastly different compared to what I do today. So I think it's, it's important to know if you're somebody like me, where specific fruit trees really should go in the landscape, just purely based on sunlight alone. And so far I've come to the conclusion that pretty much all the berry plants, uh, if you can think about any of the bushes, any of the um, canes, um, you know, as an example, here's a, a gooseberry. This is a, a relative of the gooseberry, the yostaberry, or you could say the currant. I also have honeyberries back in here. Uh, you can see another honeyberry here actually that has some flowers on it already. It's uh, March 22nd for anyone that's interested. We even have this berry here, it's called Gumi. Um, I have, believe it or not, plums back there. There's the pawpaw back there. These are persimmons and we have pears and even a small quince down there. We even have another berry called the elderberry over here that's just now getting established. So, but for the most part, out of all the things I just named really, if you want to plant something that is a bit more tolerant to having less light, not as much of that full sun as you'd like, something like strawberries is another one. These are the best plants, in my opinion, to plant in a lower light environment. So um, that's exactly what I told the person that contacted me, is that if you have an area that gets a lot more sun, well then probably don't plant the berries there. Um, maybe if you have a favorite, so if you really like raspberries and you want a lot of raspberries and you want them at the highest quality possible, then plant your raspberries in full sun. If maybe there's something, well, you're not a huge fan of, but you like to have them, maybe like blackberries as an example, or blueberries, then plant them in maybe a shadier location and don't worry about it. What really should be in the most amount of sunlight possible and the warmest site possible, which is pretty much what was this back area here against the house and probably still is to this day, are the figs and the pomegranate. I'd also probably recommend this, a similar thing for the persimmon, but you can get away with it. Um, these, in my opinion, these two things, especially for most of us, they're really just a bit cold sensitive. And if you have a cold sensitive, you live in a cold sensitive area and you're trying to push your zone, you know, maybe you're even growing citrus in a place where you need a zone push a little bit. Maybe you're growing loquats in a, you know, a, a, a place where you need to zone push a little bit. Maybe you're even in, in, the, in the desert and, um, you know, uh, Arizona as an example, and you're trying to grow more tropical like fruit. Well, you need to think about your microclimate. You need to think about where is exactly the warmest spot in your yard that is also protected from potential frost. Um, for me, I'm not growing anything really super tropical. It's just too cold here getting down to six this winter, six degrees Fahrenheit for anyone in Europe. But, uh, you know, these are just an utmost huge benefit, not just in the winter time of like protecting them and getting them through the winter, but it just their, their metabolic function. Um, when you have plants that actually can survive in the desert and are adapted more to Mediterranean, drier, warmer like, or even desert like climates, like the mulberry is one, the jujube is another one, uh, the fig, the pomegranate. These are all examples of fruit trees that have the ability to produce fruit in even the driest and super warmest condition, conditions. So if you think about in your mind, well, where do these, these fruit trees originate? Just do a Google search and this will probably answer your question. Think about where they originated from, where they've spent the most amount of time and adapted throughout evolution. And that's probably where you should plant them. So for me, the desert-like species, I like to think of the fig as almost like a cactus. Um, plant those things in the warmest and driest spot in your yard. Um, and that's for me against the house. Um, for other people, 
that may be underneath actually these big maple trees that I have here in my yard. Because believe it or not, these big maples, even though there's no leaves on them in the winter, they will provide protection. As I've seen in Florida, if anyone watches Pete's channel, he has lots of different uh, tropical plants like bananas, star fruits, all kinds of things planted underneath his big shade trees. And that oak canopy that he has down in Florida provides that microclimate to actually zone push and help him actually be able to grow those particular fruits, even though he's in a colder zone, a colder place in Florida. So the way you can really accomplish that as well, knowing your microclimates is not the most difficult thing actually to find out because I've done multiple videos now on this where you also want to find out you should probably go around and really evaluate your landscape first off before you really even plan anything really spend some time you know when i am going to buy this new farm of mine inevitably i'm going to probably spend some time in the landscape before i really commit to planting something um you know in one particular spot because i don't want to have to move things around and i know that being observant and and really paying attention to your landscape, you're going to be able to figure these things out, not just now, right? Not just in the spring when you plant the things or in the fall, maybe when you plant these fruit trees, but also in the summer and in the winter and evaluating those, the landscape at those different times of year and really being out here. Okay. Not just looking at a weather app and, and figuring this stuff out physically being out here for most of the year, at different times of the year is going to really heavily contribute to that of understanding, well, where are your windy spots? Where are the warm, where is the warmest spot of your yard? Where does the frost settle? Where are the wet spots in your yard? Where are the dry spots in your yard? Um, where is these large wind tunnels that you may have? So for me, at least for in determining where is the warmest spot in the yard, I've taken soil temperatures. I got myself a soil thermometer and I took the soil temperature in different locations all over the yard at different times of the year for multiple consecutive years. And I've really just come to learn that first off, anything up against the structure and having that geothermal heating is just in general going to have a warmer soil next to it. So for me, and what people are really concerned themselves with way too often is planting figs as an example up against their, their house it's really not something you have to concern yourself with the pomegranate i really am not totally sold on in the same sense but the fig does not have a crazy tap root yeah they have quite invasive roots but the roots stay at a very shallow depth because that's where the soil is warmest um, and if you grow them from cutting you won't have to worry about that you won't have to worry about a tap root and believe it or not, this even applies to people all the way in Southern California with John Verdict, uh, a really well-known fig grower, has a huge 20 to 30 foot vista that's been up against his house for a very long time. And he's had absolutely no problem with it um, and his foundation. Now, the other things you may want to concern yourself with. So now we've, we've kind of said, all right, well, this is the warmest. These are the species of trees that really should be in the warmest spot and the sunniest spot. We also talked about the berries being in the, you know, the shadier locations and not having to worry about them as much. Yeah, and what are the reasons for that as well? Let's just talk about that very briefly. Well, you know, by me having these honey berries and this gumi as an example, here in these shadier locations and the, these strawberries, they're not really that disease prone. Yeah, the strawberries do struggle a bit with disease. They definitely can. But for the most of them, they, they ripen uh, very reliably, easily, um, and they almost have no disease pressure across the board. Now, maybe you live in a super humid place, more humid than where I'm at, and that may be a concern of yours, but for me and uh, for probably most of us in the country, planting your berries in a shadier spot, you're not really gonna have to worry about disease. Um, so that's one thing. Now, a tree like the apple, the pear, the stone fruits, these are the most common fruit trees that most people think about. 
you know, the stone fruits are the ones with the pits, cherries, the plums, the peaches, the apricots, and all the hybrids of all of them in between. You know, those are very disease prone trees. And I don't mean just on the trees themselves. Um, most of the time, you know, fixing the disease pressure on the tree itself can be really alleviated by improving the immune system of the tree. Just like us as humans, right? We can take different supplements, different vitamins and minerals to help our immune system. Uh, even our microbiome has a huge part of that. It's the same thing at the soil level, is that if we really feed the soil of different, different types of mulch and really have a diverse uh, diversity of mulch, that increases the level of bacteria and fungus and soil life that of course helps the tree. And of course is gonna help the overall health of the tree or the immune system of the tree. And you're not really gonna struggle with disease, but you will struggle with that on the fruits. And the fruits are really what we're eating, right? We're not eating the trees, we're not eating the leaves, we're not eating the branches, we're eating the fruits. So for me, having these stone fruits, these apples here, actually these plums that we just looked at in very disease prone places where there really isn't a ton of airflow. In fact, there isn't a whole lot of sun and even the sun rises over there in the morning and quickly goes over like this and goes very quickly to these big maples and that big cherry, that black cherry tree. And for most of the day, believe it or not, other than maybe one small instance in the morning, these apple trees are completely shaded until the sun goes all the way around to where it is pretty much right now in the afternoon. So the problem with that is that these apples that we're now discussing and these disease prone trees that we're discussing have all kinds of problems with disease. And actually, I will say that if you had a plum, excuse me, if you had a peach, you may suffer from a lot of peach leaf curl with such a higher humidity environment, higher humidity location with less light. Luckily, my peaches are all in much more sunlight than uh, some of my other fruit trees. So I haven't really had too much of that peach leaf curl pressure here. But if they were in this location where it's considerably less light, even than right over here where the espied peaches are, they would certainly struggle because these apples struggle from something called cedar apple rust. So even though I did mention that you're probably not going to struggle with the berries in terms of disease. But if you had an apple or one of these stone fruits, the tree itself may actually struggle with disease. Even by amending the soil over time, I have seen an improvement in the immune system and the health. And it seems like the disease pressure is less and less of the cedar apple rust. The um, peach leaf curl is less and less every year. It doesn't mean that we should plant them in the shadiest environment. So for you know, for these apples, I just would not recommend that. Not only for the fruit quality, for the disease of the for the uh, the the, tr the disease on the trees themselves, but also the the disease. Excuse me, guys, of the fruits themselves. So we have many things here to worry about: the fruit quality, the disease pressure of the tree, and the disease pressure of the fruits. That's a lot to think about, and that's a lot to solve. Uh, if you plant the tree in the wrong place, you're going to be fighting this stuff constantly. And it's just, uh, it's just not ideal. Let's just put it like that. Is it doable? Yeah, I'm doing it. Is it something you want to do? Is it, in the, is it, it was a mistake on my part? Yeah. Knowing what I know now, would I do it again? No, I would not plant these apples in five to six hours of light. If I was going to grow apples or stone fruits or pears, I need a minimum of eight to nine hours of light. And I'd probably even go a little bit higher than that. Um, so that's where I'm at. And then, of course, uh, if this were, you know, plums as an example, which we do have here on the back, which are the youngest despiers I've created. Plums suffer from rot on the fruits themselves. So disease, again, once again, or even these European grapevines that are very prone to disease as well, they get something called black rot. And luckily I've kind of come overcome that with the help of uh, some people who really know what they're doing and I bag my grapes. 
with a wax paper bag and I'm able to grow them disease free, which is amazing. And I'm lucky that I'm able to do that. But again, I'm fighting this thing that never, I really shouldn't have to fight. And the, these plums are the same thing. Where again, I've planted these guys, these espaliers against the fence. Um, I've planted these in a lower light environment. And the disease pressure here is going to be extremely high compared to pretty much anywhere else in the yard, especially if they're not pruned properly. Luckily, I've pruned these guys to such a uh, great degree this year. The form is now perfect on them, as perfect as I can get it. I have to keep up though with the summer pruning, as most of us probably should in general anyway, full sun or in shade, whatever the case may be. But this needs to be absolutely perfect for me to even be able to enjoy these fruits because the disease pressure of rot is going to be so high in these shadier environments. And by the way, there's not a ton of airflow that comes through here. Well, why is that, Ross? Because there's a fence right here. So what I told the other, the person who messaged me, this, this woman in the, the Philadelphia area, well, plant your berries in the shadier locations, but plant your other fruit trees that aren't the figs, that aren't the pomegranates, that aren't your more desert-like species. Plant the other ones, the stone fruits, the apples, the pears. Plant them in as much light as possible so there's as less disease pressure as possible. You have as much fruit quality as possible. And plant them away from structures. Plant them away from the house. Plant them away from the fence. Plant them away from the shed. Uh, give them the airflow that they need. And you will benefit from it big time. You won't have to suffer and you won't have to put up with This will just be an easier process. Now, I will have one word about this pawpaw tree because the word on the street as when I started growing fruit and that you'll probably still find today is that the pawpaw loves to be grown in dappled light or a very shady environment, especially when they're young. Um, this could just not be further from the, the truth. Ideally, you wanna plant this, if you wanna wait 20 years to get fruit, yeah, plant it in the shade. <laughs> this is the seventh year that I've, I've been growing these, uh, these pawpaws and they're just now flowering. They're just now gonna fruit. Well, fingers crossed they're gonna fruit. But uh, if you want to wait forever, plant them in the shade. Otherwise, I would seriously consider planting them in the, in the sun, as much sunlight as you can give them. Um, so those are the main, I think, the basics there of, uh, of, of you know, where to plant things um, in your yard. You know, whether that's based on heat, sunlight, we didn't even really talk about water in the soil, but we did talk about the pressure of disease. We talked about the, the sunlight. Um, so if you guys are interested, I guess what we can do in the future is continue this little series here and we could talk more about um, planting things in terms of, you know, do I want to plant this in a, maybe a windier environment or maybe it can't handle the wind Maybe I want to plant something in a much drier soil. Um, I think in general, a lot of that is extremely location dependent because maybe I would want to plant a fig tree in a, in a moister environment if I lived in the desert. But if I lived here, I want as less water as possible. You know, um, in general, you just want as less water as possible. So I would, as a general rule of thumb for anyone interested in this, in this video, you got this far, I thank you. Um, you probably don't want to grow your fruit in a very wet location. You want to really evaluate the soil and pick your spots. Pick a bit of a higher ground location. Uh, if you have a yard that you know has a bit of an angle to it, maybe your neighbor's yards. I have a friend of mine who unfortunately it was his dream to grow a garden uh, and to plant all these fruit trees of his own. He finally bought his own house with his wife and his two daughters. And um, unfortunately, 
the house and the location that he picked, all the neighbor's yards converge on a slope down into his. So he has just, anytime it rains, there's just so much moisture that accumulates in his backyard. And it just makes it a bit more difficult uh, to grow anything because there's more anaerobic conditions in the soil. And of course, his fruit quality is gonna inevitably suffer um, by being where he's at. So uh, I think it's a, a huge thing that is often overlooked and I would seriously consider, especially the location that you're planting in, in terms of how moist the soil is there, but also considering if you're gonna plant the tree in a mound or the bush on a mound, or if you're gonna create yourself a nice little well, of course, depending on where you live. So this is all, you know, really based on, I would say, just the general rule of thumb. If you get about 20 to 30 inches of rain every year on an annual basis, then you could probably just get away with planting things uh, on a bit higher ground and not have to worry about creating a mound, not have to worry about creating a well. If you get less than 20 inches of rain, you might want to consider planting everything in a well where you plant things slightly below grade and you create yourself a nice little moat in a sense, uh, not a moat, a uh, kind of like a berm that, so that when you water your trees, the water seeps into the ground and uh, for each individual ring around the tree is what I'm kind of getting at. So the water stays in that particular ring and soaks down into the drip line of the tree. Uh, and then of course, if you're over 30 inches of rain annually, a good general rule of thumb is actually you want less water and you may want to consider now planting things on a mound. And that could be any kind of mound, four inches high, two feet high, depending on the species, depending on what it is. So there's a lot to cover. There really is. I will say that a lot of the stone fruits really don't like wet feet. The figs don't like wet feet. I would so your grapes definitely don't like wet feet, right? Grapes are grown in the driest of climates. Think about how wine is produced. So there you go, guys. Uh, you know, those are some of the basics now of growing fruit and planting and figuring out where things go. I know this will help a lot of people. Uh, you know, you can watch this almost 30 minute video and learn quite a bit, or you could read a book. It's up to you. But this is pretty much what the books will tell you. Um, so I thank everybody here for watching. You know, it is still that planting time, so that's why I'm making these videos. Some of you guys may be interested in planting some of these fruit trees, and uh, it's never too late. All right, hit that subscribe button if you got this far. I do appreciate it. We'll see you for the next one. Take care.